Hello everybody, welcome to number 27, I'm Jack, and today I'm here to talk to you about the Jensen Interceptor, and this is a fascinating car, because it is yet another example of a failing British car industry, but crucially, this was actually a really good car, yet it still bankrupted Jensen. Why is that? Well, on the surface, it makes absolutely no sense. This was Jensen's most successful car. 6,000 were sold between 1966 and 1976. It was a car that was extremely popular with celebrities from Clark Gable, Princess Anne, Roger Moore, you name it, they loved this car, so it had a good image. It was a good car, really, plus, to top it all off, it really added the best from three countries, Britain, Italy, and the US. The Americans supplied the stonking motor, the Italians the styling, and the Brits the fantastic technology and the interior. So then why did it fail? Do check out Taina's website, they are brilliant value and there's a discount code in the video description. continuity error <laughs> can you spot it anyway back to this wonderful car when I said it was a marriage of American power British sort of mechanicals and interior comfort plus Italian style what I mean is the Italians styled this it was carrozzeria touring the Brits obviously Jensen did the layout chassis all those bits, but the engine was a monster from Chrysler. The earlier cars had 6.3 liter, I think, V8s. This one, this is a Mark III, has a 7.2 liter Chrysler V8. It gets the same engine that has been in such cars as the Dodge Charger, I think the Barracuda. I'm not an expert on American stuff, but it is an absolutely massive engine. The car that preceded this, the CV8, had what I think some people call controversial styling. To me, they look absolutely fantastic, but I don't think they were universally loved. So when Jensen decided to make this car, they wanted sort of wider market appeal. So they went for Italian design. Touring did the design. I think the initial cars were made by Vignale, not with the best results and actually quality improved once Jensen brought assembly back in house. The chassis has wishbones in the front and a solid rear axle. It uses the Chrysler three-speed gearbox. And it is a car that drives, it drives like a mini Rolls-Royce. It's a fantastic thing. So there's a couple of main reasons why it failed, but I'm gonna tell you one of them now, one of them later. It was phenomenally expensive. It was much more than the equivalent E-Type and even more expensive than the Aston Martin, the V8 that ran at the same time. You can see where that money went though, because it's a car that especially by British standards in the sort of late 60s, is really nicely made there's quality touches all over and although it used Lucas switch gear it was all slightly different slightly bespoke to this specific car which means that nowadays they are an absolute nightmare to buy bits for now they were quite heavy things um, 600 1600 kilograms for the late 60s is definitely a beast of the car I think a massive proportion of that is the Chrysler engine and I suppose it was supposed to be a four-seater there isn't a huge amount of room in the back but it's not a joke four-seater like a 911 I guess you could get some sort of medium-sized children in there and it is really lovingly trimmed 
the interior looks really nice the ergonomics aren't terrible the driving position is nice the steering wheel's a little bit lower than i would ideally like but it's not bad now visibility is absolutely fantastic so much so that it almost seems to bring the outside into the car with you and makes that quite a special experience in itself then you have the lovely materials this leather which i think feels almost rolls royce quality the veneers and the Wil wilton carpet even the little levers to adjust the seats backwards and forwards are covered in leather lovely attention to detail great place to sit in and reasonably well insulated against noise as well you can hear that lovely v8 burbling away as you're going but only so much that it's a pleasant thing rather than something that gets in the way just going to pull over here and then we will do our usual sort of pull up the road and see what it feels like when we give it some throttle because these were also very rapid cars for the time and still today I think that they're not exactly slouchers the original cars put out I mean the figures sort of vary quite wildly but actually let's just go for it foot down So it still has a good turn of pace about it and you can hear it's just all talk. But the cars at the time, yeah, they had anything between sort of 300, 330 horsepower, depending on what carb setup they had, which engine it was, down to about 220 horsepower, although I've heard it's even lower than that, once the emissions regulations kicked in. This is a Mark III, it has the 7.2 litre engine, it also has the updated fuel injection system, which was designed later on once Jensen went bankrupt and the various bits were split off. And I think there was a company just doing the spares. So the injection system makes it much more efficient. I said there were two reasons why it failed. The second reason was that they were absurdly thirsty. This particular car with a fuel injection now, if driven carefully, can even sort of hit 90 miles to the gallon. But back in the 60s and cars with carbs will do anything from 8 to 12 mpg. Now it was launched in 1966, but by 1973, the early 70s, there was the oil crisis so big thirsty cars like this suffered tremendously and there was no other option you could only have it with these engines so at that time Jensen decided right well we have to come up with an alternative it had already been sold the original old owners I think sold it in the late 60s the new owners decided we're gonna make a car which is a bit more affordable to run and to buy they retained Donald Healy and the Jensen Healy was born. It's a car which to me has never really appealed. I can't quite get on with the looks, but I, I know why they did it. It used the smaller Lotus twin cam engine, which at the time was very unreliable. So I think as much as this failing, it was actually due to that car being launched, being very unreliable, all the money going into that, and these not selling as well as they could have. Now it's heartbreaking because they are brilliant cars and let me tell you a little bit about how it drives. I think I mentioned earlier very much like a Junior Bentley, Junior Rolls Royce. It's a little bit more, it's a little bit more wieldy than, than a Rolls. It has a really lovely steering feel, it's power assisted, it's rack and pinion. It's quite slow but gives you loads of feel the suspension just demolishes everything you have in front of you it is a consumer fantastic GT you can feel the weight the steering also isn't over assisted so it works quite well with the, the weighing of the other controls if you put your foot down it drops down a gear really quickly and sort of picks up its skirts and 
sort of goes down the road in quite a majestic manner. It doesn't feel like the kind of car that I'd want to throw around. The body is pretty well controlled at normal driving speeds, but it does feel like if you were to abuse it, brake too hard or turn too suddenly, it would start to move around quite a lot. But it is a fantastic car. And of course it was relatively unknown. It wasn't a flash car. So rather than get a Ferrari or a boring big Merc, this was actually a genuine option. The only problem, as I mentioned, was that terrible fuel consumption. The later cars got better and better in terms of quality as well. The Mark IIs had a far nicer interior and then there were detailed differences really apart from that mainly detail differences between the Mark 1, Mark 2 and Mark 3. And you can just picture yourself maybe doing a midnight run from Monaco back to London in the 70s and this would handle it with absolute aplomb. Something else I think we need to mention is that alongside this, Jensen also launched the FF, which I think is the only car that ever used the Ferguson four-wheel drive system. Ferguson made tractors at the time. They developed the system. They thought lots of car makers would buy it. They were way ahead of their time. And that car could have had extraordinarily appeal outside of the UK. However, because of the way that it was designed, some of the components for the four-wheel drive system ran on the left-hand side of the car, so converting it to left-hand drive wasn't possible. As such, they missed loads of sales, including the crucial North American market, and that is something else that could have really buoyed up Jensen. It looked very similar to the Interceptor, but in actual fact, it was 12 inches longer. You can just see there's that extra sort of side intake strike as well. I think it's just so sad that you know, in the 70s, the British car industry was just abused and compared for things that it just didn't do very well. The cars weren't very good. They weren't good quality. And then they go and make a car which really is pretty good. Yes, they had some issues, I think cooling issues as well in the Mark I, but generally speaking, a well-made car, a great product. And yet the company still went under. Was there just no forgiving the British car industry in those days? So if you'll indulge me, another quick message as well. This is the first of my videos that are gonna be sponsored. It's not sponsored in the way of an integration. Don't worry, I'm not gonna do those sort of 30 second, one minute bits trying to sell you stuff. But Taina Batteries, who I've used previously and have been absolutely fantastic car battery suppliers, they wanted to support the channel. They were happy to do it in a non-intrusive way with a logo and a very quick message at the beginning of each video. So for the next videos, there will be their sponsorship. I want to thank them for that. I will put a link to their website in the video description and it will include a discount code as well. So do go and have a look and if you need a car battery going forward, please do consider them. This is a fantastic intercontinental cruiser, a car that I am privileged to have driven, a real slice of British history. There's a twinge of sadness to it, but it makes an amazing classic car today. I think you can get them for about, sort of starting to about 50, 70,000 for a really good one. So still a lot less than the sort of best E-types, um, but a relative bargain. Thank you all so much for watching. If you have an interesting car that you want me to do a review on, please do contact me. Instagram is the best way. And I really look forward to seeing you for the next video.